Black Dahlia Episode 18 Was There a Police Cover-Up? Part 2 In the last episode we looked at the enforced, also known as the Black Widow, prostitution ring that flourished under the corrupt regime of Mayor Frank Shaw. However, the Black Widow's ring survived Shaw's ousting and would still be going strong at the time of her arrest for pandering in 1940. Although Forrest was dubbed the Black Widow because of her black book containing the names of politicians, city officials, business figures, and high-ranking LAPD members, she could have just as easily gotten her nickname for how she treated her girls. Once her girls had been lured in with promises of good money and a glamorous lifestyle as high-class escorts, they were forced into a sexual routine more like that of a common streetwalker. They had to entertain several clients daily, even when sick, and often only received half their earnings. No doubt so that Forst could afford her own lavish lifestyle. She owned a fenced and gated, air-conditioned home sitting on ten acres of choice San Fernando Valley land. If they failed to live up to the Black Widow's expectations or complained, she would throw them out. And then the young women, most away from home in a strange place without close friends or relatives to rely on, would probably find themselves working the streets. But then the Black Widow went too far. One of her new girls, Maxine Rail, wanted out, but was held captive along with another disillusioned girl, Helen Smith. Maxine managed to get a message to Captain Walter Hunter of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and the girls were rescued. Forrest was arrested and charged with pandering along with the ring's leader, Charles Montgomery and his lieutenant, Bristol Barrett who was referred to as Glamour Boy. The widow's girls had had enough bad treatment, and at the trial, several testified against her. When it was the widow's turn to take the stand, she spilled her guts about the corruption that happened under the Shaw regime, and told about her payoffs to the vice squad, especially to LAPD vice squad head Guy McAfee, who had earned the nickname Capone of Los Angeles. McAfee had left Los Angeles in 1939, fleeing to his already established operations in Las Vegas after the special election that ousted Frank Shaw and replaced him with Fletcher Boron, who had been instrumental in aiding civic and civic leader Clifford Clinton by appointing Clinton to the 1937 grand jury. Along with Chief Two-Gun Davis's department aiding and abetting Mayor Shaw, the crooked vice squad under McAfee shows just how corrupt the LAPD was during the late 30s. McAfee owned and operated several brothels and illegal gambling operations, and moved his operations to Las Vegas. A cartoon that appeared in the publication Critic of Critics in the early 1930s depicted McAfee as an octopus with his tentacles pulling in profits from Vegas, illegal liquor sales, and gambling operations, and having control in City Hall and the police department. Forrest received a 10-year sentence for pandering to be served at the State Institution for Women at Tehachapi. In the end, she would serve five years. Montgomery and Barrett also did time. One of Forrest's girls carried herself differently at the trial, walking a fine line between telling the truth and not being a snitch. Brenda Allen said she had been brought in willingly under the charms of glamour boy Barrett but neither he nor the Black Widow had coerced her into prostitution. But she did tell enough of the truth that the other girls did not see her testimony as sticking up for the ring or denying their individual accounts of poor treatment. Allen's way of carefully and deliberately testifying so as not to piss anyone off gained support with the other girls, but also got the attention of underworld figures who were looking for Forrest's replacement. Whether deliberately or accidentally, Brenda Allen had just promoted herself as the main contender to replace Forrest as the premier madam of Los Angeles. The vice underworld had just lost its black widow, but was about to see the rise of the vice queen. Brenda Allen was born Marie Mitchell and used several aliases during her career, Brenda Allen Burns, Marie Brooks, Marie Cash, Brenda Burris, and Marie Belank. She had a way of always escaping the full brunt of the law, claiming that she had been arrested 18 times but had never spent a day in jail. And when she became Hollywood's main madam, she had learned from the mistakes of Forrest and other predecessors and changed her way of business. John Bunton said this of Allen in his book L.A. Noir The Struggle for the Soul of America's Most Seductive City, page 15. 
Brenda Allen was Hollywood's most prosperous madam in part because she was so cautious. Rather than take on the risks that came with running a body house, Allen relied on a telephone exchange service to communicate with her clients, clients who were vetted with the utmost care. While Allen would occasionally insert chaste ads in actors' directories or distribute her phone number to select cabbies, bartenders, and bellhops, she prided herself on serving the creme de la creme of Los Angeles. It was rumored that she even ran a Dun and Bradstreet check on prospective customers to ensure their suitability. Those who were accepted were rewarded with Allen's full and carefully considered attention. All of her girls were analyzed as to their more intimate characteristics, which were then carefully noted on file cards for cross-tabulation with her clients' preferences. The selection Allen offered was considerable. By 1948, she had 114 pleasure girls in her harem. Allen would sometimes advertise her girls, and even herself in Hollywood trade publications, listed alongside actresses. Allen quickly saw prostitution profits rise. Where Forrest had seen between $3,500 and $5,000 a week, and had paid a $50 weekly payoff to the Vice Squad for each house. Allen was bringing in between $4,500 and $4,700 a day, and had to pay corrupt LAPD officials $50 weekly per girl. And she still made a profit after she paid her mafia dues to Bugsy Siegel and Mickey Cohen, just as Forrest had done with Jack Dragna and Johnny Rosselli. But for all of Allen's payoffs and cautions, she took a step too far when she took a cop into her bed. At first, she must have thought it a good idea to pay off the vice cop with pleasure on top of payoffs. And one day, it must have seemed a really good idea when it saved her life. She and her lover, Sergeant Elmer V. Jackson, were parked near her apartment when Roy Pee Wee Lewis shoved a machine gun barrel in Jackson's face and commanded him to give it to me. Jackson thrust the car door open, knocking the gun aside, and gave to Pee Wee a bullet in the face, and then he emptied his gun into the fleeing vehicle of Pee Wee's buddy, Paul Allen. At first, Sergeant Jackson was hailed as a hero, and Brenda Allen was listed on the incident report as a clerical worker for the administrative vice squad, where Jackson worked as second in command under Lieutenant Rudy Wellpot. The two had a lucrative racket, not just profiting from prostitution payoff, but from illegal gambling operations, and claims from Mickey Cohen of them extorting money from him. And it wasn't long before investigators realized the woman in the car during the shootout wasn't an LAPD employee, but the vice queen herself Brenda Allen. Around now Sergeant Charles Stoker came into the story. I leave it up to you, the viewer, to come to your own conclusions about Stoker and his reliability. Some swear that his book Thicker End Thieves is a true and honest account of the events. Black Dahlia researcher Steve Hodell even wrote the foreword and even seems to have had a hand in publishing a reprint of the book. Steve Hodell even writes on his website. If you've read my book you know Sergeant Charles Stoker was and remains my personal hero. On the other hand, researcher Larry Harnish had this to say on his website. Anybody who takes thicker end thieves at face value isn't worthy of calling themselves a researcher or a historian. The whole Stoker account is too long to discuss here in its entirety, so I'll just touch on the topics usually associated with the Black Dahlia murder, the Brenda Allen prostitution ring, and the abortion ring, which we already partially covered in a previous episode and will look at closer in the upcoming Walter Bailey episode. According to Stoker's account, he and two other officers were called to investigate a complaint at an apartment building. There he met apartment manager, James Arthur Vavs Jr., who had served time in the army before serving more time in prison, and was a known electronics genius. And in time it would turn out that Vavs was happy with playing both sides. He later accepted a job as wiretapper for Mickey Cohen, spilling his guts to Cohen about what the cops had on him. Soon after his association with Stoker and then Cohen, Bob's found Jesus with the help of Billy Graham, left the world of organized crime, and became a youth minister. I'll put a link to his 1997 obituary in the New York Times and an article written by his son below. But for now, Vavs, who also operated an electronics shop, asked if he could ride along with Stoker on his investigations. 
Once, Vavs was alone when Stoker sent a man into Brenda Allen's apartment building to keep an eye on her apartment. The officer reported no one coming or going but did state that he heard the phone ring and reported hearing a muffled conversation. Vavs then offered his services to Stoker as related in Stoker's own words from Thicker End Thieves pages 87 and 88. Upon hearing the officer's story, Vavs remarked that he had some equipment which would permit us to listen to Brenda's telephone conversations. We were curious. He said he would bring the equipment the following night. The next evening, Vavs appeared with a small box containing wiretapping equipment. We went to Brenda's, entered the basement through a rear door and in short order Vavs had tapped Brenda's line. To say that I was amazed at what I heard would be an understatement. Calls were coming in so rapidly over Brenda's line that she was receiving them by priority and selection. There were more calls than she could possibly handle. As soon as she received one call and dispatched a girl, or girls, she would dial the telephone exchange number and contact the operator who would give her the names of waiting customers. Brenda would then decide whom she would favor or eliminate. We listened for several nights. Occasionally, I would dispatch an officer to the address where Brenda had sent a girl, and he would arrive in time to make an arrest. The girls were being arrested night after night, and it was becoming difficult for me to convince officers handling the arrests that the information was through luck and coincidence. I knew that, eventually, Brenda would suspect that her wires were being tapped, particularly if the rumor were true that a policeman was running her business or advising her on operations. We never remained in the basement on the tap for more than 10 or 15 minutes at a time, for fear of being caught. We merely waited to hear the location where a girl had been sent and where we thought we could make an arrest. I told Vavs that Brenda was bound to become suspicious. I was eager to learn the addresses of the various girls who were working under Brenda's aegis so that we could stay away from her apartment house basement. It was in my mind to get the telephone numbers of all of Brenda's girls, so that we could tail them away from their residences when they left on call. Moreover, we could then tap the telephone lines of the various girls and take them out of the play, one by one. I can easily devise an instrument which will record the numbers dialed by Brenda, Vav spoke up. I'll bring it along tomorrow night. The following night Vavs brought along a gadget which he called an impulse indicator. It was an instrument which would indicate each number as it was dialed, a very satisfactory piece of equipment. Within three hours' time the first night we had used it, I garnered 29 telephone numbers that Brenda had dialed, most of them numbers of girls she had working for her. The second night when we used the impulse indicator, Brenda dialed a number that rang a bell in my mind. Then it struck me full force. The number she had called was the confidential number of the administrative vice squad. The wiretapping revealed the truth about Sergeant Jackson and Barbara Allen and led to a raid on a brothel at 8436 Herald Way where police found a box of note cards detailing the names and sexual tastes of 200 celebrities and other notables. Here Stoker made a mistake, he thought Allen was trying to frame him, so he contacted Jackson about what he had heard. Stoker said on pages 89 and 90. At that time I had high ideals concerning the Los Angeles Police Department. I was zealous of its good name, and when infrequently police officers had gotten into trouble, I had taken their trouble to heart and considered it a personal matter. All night long I thought about what I had heard. I was trying to figure out what to do. Finally, I decided. I determined that I would call Jackson the next day and tell him exactly what I had learned. In this way, I naively concluded that I would be doing Jackson, a fellow officer, a favor as well as protecting the good name of the department. The following day, I telephoned Jackson and told him the exact situation. I explained that I was acting out of a spirit of loyalty for a fellow officer. I advised Jackson that Brenda Allen was making a complete fool of him and that she had no regard for him whatsoever. I related the facts of her telephone conversation to the other man immediately after she had finished talking to him. Now, I realized that this action constituted one of the most foolish things I ever did in my life. Jackson wasn't interested in my advice, 
but he showed a lively interest in what I told him. His major reaction seemed to be that of obvious jealousy. He wanted to know the name of the rival Brenda had called after she had finished talking to him. He did, however, promise me that he would have nothing further to do with Brenda. But Jackson was not done with Alan. In fact, he must have tipped her off to Stoker's investigation. From page 90 of Thicker and Thieves Here is the payoff. If you believe that there is little honor among thieves, do not believe that there is much more among policemen if they are crooked. The following night we had been in the apartment house basement but a few minutes when Brenda walked in on us as brazen a whore as ever lived. She demanded that we go upstairs to her apartment. We did with Vov's accompanying us. Although she had never laid eyes on me, Brenda called me by name. Stoker, you think you're just a wise son of a bitch. I wanted to slap her right across her filthy mouth, but I deemed it wiser to listen to what she had to say inasmuch as I was now convinced that Jackson had told her everything. You're biting off more than you can chew. I can either get you fired or transferred before the month is over. You can well imagine how this declaration struck me, coming from a whore, the idea that my police career was at the mercy of a gaudy, body strumpet madam. But, foolishly, I had underestimated Brenda. At the time, my only answer was to laugh in her face. Due to the wiretapping, Brenda Allen was arrested and charged with pandering. But the investigation then hit a snag. Investigators needed to prove coercion for the pandering charge to stick. But Allen's girls did not want to turn on her. She treated them far better than Black Widow Forced had treated her girls. So, with nothing to go on, she was quickly released. Later, the LAPD returned to Stoker to get the job done by appointing policewoman Audrey Davis to work with him on a plan to get Davis undercover in Allen's ring. However, in the end, Davis would prove instrumental in not just the investigation into Brenda Allen, but also as we have seen in a previous episode, the investigation into the abortion ring, but she would also play a part in Stoker's downfall. With Stoker watching in the bushes for Audrey's protection, Audrey made contact with Alan, who offered her employment as a $30 girl. Supposedly during the meeting, Alan told Audrey to take a customer who walked into the establishment. Audrey got out of it by claiming it was her time of the month. It seemed that all was going well with the plan. Alan was to set up an appointment for Audrey to have a medical appointment before started work, an appointment that in the end was never set up. Investigators tried to set up an appointment on the night that Audrey was supposed to start work, but that didn't work out either. Stoker believed that Alan had been tipped off that Audrey was undercover. Audrey never did report to work, so all they had to go on was Alan's offer of work to Audrey. It was thin, but the command by Alan for Audrey to take a customer on their initial meeting was deemed enough to prove pandering, and so Brenda Allen was brought to trial. At the trial, Judge Joseph Call ordered that the 200 names previously mentioned recovered in the box of note cards not be disclosed because In the box are names of dignitaries of the screen and radio and executives of responsible positions in many great industries. Publication of their names would be ruinous to their careers and cause them great public disgrace. Brenda Allen was found guilty and sentenced to five years. To try to get a better sentence, Allen spilled her guts, admitting that she had paid off police, even naming Jackson and his boss in administrative vice, Lieutenant Rudy Wellpot, as recipients. She even named Stoker as being on the take. That said, Stoker was the hero of the day after his testimony before the 1949 grand jury. Jury foreman Harry Lawson had this to say. Stoker is the real informer in this case. Brenda Allen is just peanuts compared to what he has given us. He should be under guard. If he continues to name names and situations like he did today, he will be found dead on the curb within five days. Whether Stoker was or was not on the take is a matter of debate, but either way, his fortunes were about to turn. Both Audrey and Vavs would change their stories and allegiances. Mickey Cohen came forward on May 5, 1949, during the trial of Harold Happy Metzler, 
with allegations of cops being on the take, and by now, Vavs was employed by Cohen. And Cohen had wiretap recordings done by Vavs to prove it, not to mention Vavs showing up at trial with his bugging machine. And Audrey admitted she perjured herself during the Brenda Allen trial. Using this admittance, Brenda Allen appealed her sentence. Allen was released on September 2, 1949. She was the only one to receive any time. Of all the crooked cops and criminals mentioned, only Allen did any time. In fact, she would do more, being forced to finish an eight-month sentence in 1951. Jackson was demoted, but would serve as a cop until his retirement. During the investigation, Stoker too was demoted back to traffic cop. But he would later lose his job after charges of burglary surfaced, with the help and testimony of Audrey Davis, who claimed that she loved Stoker and he took advantage of that love. It did turn out that Audrey's grandfather was a former combination boss named Charlie Crawford, and her father was a former deputy chief named Howard Cross, who had retired to Las Vegas some years before. Some say the charges against Stoker were trumped up, others of course disagree. Whether you think Stoker was a hero thrown under the bus or just another crooked cop, he was right about the payoffs to administrative vice head Wellpot and his subordinate Jackson. And he did testify truthfully to the grand jury, a testimony that drew the scorn of his fellow officers. And the fact that Jackson and Wellpot had the balls to shake down mobster Mickey Cohen shows just how bold the corrupt police were during this time. It also shows that even with a mayor like Fletcher Boron, who wanted to fix the corruption, nothing had really changed since the days of Mayor Shaw. The corruption just went a little further under the table, and like Brenda Allen and her prostitution ring, just played things a little safer than her predecessor, the Black Widow Forced. After being charged with perjury, Police Chief Horrell and Assistant Chief Reed resigned, although the charges were dismissed and Horrell received a full acquittal. Another major scandal investigated by the 1949 grand jury was what had become known as the Dillon fiasco, already looked at in detail in previous episodes. The Dillon fiasco came about after the disastrous way the investigation into suspect Leslie Dillon played out. No doubt Dillon's lawsuit played a part as well. Dr. Deriver quickly saw himself under fire from the press after an article by Sarah Boynoff titled, Investigate Black Dahlia Fiasco, appeared in the Los Angeles Daily News and her follow-up titled, Dr. Deriver Background Revealed. The first article drew the attention of the city council. Councilman Ernest E. Debs called for an investigation into Deriver's credentials saying, I want to know about this man whom we have hired, and what his skills and qualifications are. This is not the first time he has been under fire. I wonder if we passed blindly in hiring this man. And Councilman Ed J. Davenport added. He has placed the city and the police department in an embarrassing position. Several times in the past he hit the headlines and had to recant his original moves. Deriver appeared before the grand jury in what was called an informal and unofficial visit. No stenographer recorded the visit, so no complete transcript of his testimony has been revealed. But John Brian King said this in the foreword to his printing of the 2000 edition of Deriver's book, The Sexual Criminal. Deriver then voluntarily appeared before the grand jury in an informal and unofficial visit, a stenographer was not present, on the afternoon of October 18, 1949. According to the Times, Deriver's appearance was the touch-off of a grand jury inquiry into the Black Dahlia murder case. The psychiatrist spoke of factions and jealousies within the upper ranks of the LAPD that had hindered the department's investigative abilities, and he also recounted the histories of a few suspects in the Black Dahlia case, especially Leslie Dillon. Armed with photographs and documents, Deriver was inside the grand jury room for two hours. Jury foreman Harry Lawson said this of the doctor's appearance and his opinion of the LAPD's handling of the Black Dahlia case. There are a lot of things we want to know about before we start the ball rolling. But many of us do believe there is a possibility that the police handling of the case fell short of the mark of top efficiency. Investigators of the Black Dahlia murder including Harry Hansen and Finus Brown were called to testify at the grand jury. 
from Detective Harry Hansen's testimony before the 1949 grand jury. I have a little pet theory of my own. I think that a medical man committed the murder, a very fine surgeon. I base that conclusion on the way the body was bisected. It is unusual in this sense, that the point at which the body was bisected is, according to eminent medical men, the easiest spot in the spinal column to sever. He hit it exactly. I've seen many horrible mutilation cases, many of them, and if any of you ladies and gentlemen had ever seen a case like that, and would see the pictures of this Elizabeth Short case, you could detect the difference immediately. Further allegations of a police cover-up of the Black Dahlia murder stem from missing evidence. The evidence file on the Black Dahlia is sealed. Over the years only a select few investigators assigned to the still-open case have had access to the files. Researcher Steve Hodell in his book Black Dahlia Avenger claimed this evidence is missing from the Dahlia case file as well as claimed werewolf murder victims Gladys Kern and Jean French as discussed in the previous episode, from page 566 of the book. Original address book belonging to the victim mailed to press by the suspect. Victim's identification and personal photographs sent in by the Avenger. Person shoes belonging to victim Elizabeth Short. Original 12 hand-printed notes mailed to police by Black. Dahlia Avenger, potential DNA. Black hair follicles found on her body believed to belong to the suspect. Victim's hair had been eliminated, potential DNA. Man's Croton military watch found near victim's body at the crime scene. Promise is a promise telegram and follow-up investigation of identity of sender. Missing evidence in the 1948 Gladys Kern stabbing murder would include Unique one-of-a-kind jungle knife, tentatively identified by Joe Barrett, taken from Hodel residence White handkerchief left at crime scene by suspect, potential DNA Original handwritten note mailed by suspect to press from same mailbox as 1947 Dahlia note, potential DNA. Photograph of unidentified mail found in victim's desk. Missing evidence in the 1947 Jean French red lipstick murder would include black hair follicles belonging to the suspect found under victim's fingernails, potential DNA. White handkerchief left at crime scene by suspect, potential. DNA. Purse, shoes, and clothing belonging to victim. He said LAPD detectives Brian Carr and David Lampkin admitted these items were missing in an off-camera press conference given to Los Angeles Times Magazine reporter Paul Teeter and Aaron Moriarty and David Browning of the CBS News program 48 Hours. How could evidence just go missing from a sealed case file? The possibility exists that some evidence could have disappeared not due to deliberate cover-up, but through negligence on the part of investigators. Director David Lynch related this interesting account of his meeting with famed detective John St. John also known as Jigsaw John from his book Room to Dream page 389. John St. John was the second detective on the Black Dahlia murder, which is a story that gets people going all over the world, and he knew I was interested in that story. So one day he calls me, and this is like getting a call from Clark. Gable, and he says. Let me take you to dinner at Musso and Frank's. This is a real honor, I'm not kidding. So I'm sitting in a booth at Musso and Frank's with John St. John and we have dinner, and after dinner he looks at me and sort of smiles. Then he turns away and goes to his briefcase, pops it open, and takes out a beautiful, glossy black and white photo that he lays on the table in front of me. It's a picture of the black dahlia lying in the grass, and it's in mint condition. The focus and the detail were perfect. He says, what do you see? I'm looking at this thing, just marveling, and I study every single detail and I'm thinking and thinking. He let me look at it for a long time, and I knew there was something he wanted me to see, but after a while I finally had to say to him, I don't see it, and he smiled and took the photo away. He would have been proud of me if I'd seen what he was trying to show me, and that would have been worth a lot, and I fucking failed. So I kept thinking of this thing like a burning anvil in my head, then suddenly I knew what it was. That picture was taken at night with a flash, 
and that opens up a whole realm of possibilities regarding that case. If even a detective as experienced as Jigsaw John would remove evidence from the Black Dahlia case file to show to a movie director, who knows how many others took evidence to show celebrities for bragging rights. And if this story is true, this points to important evidence being taken from sealed police files and shown to a movie director. A nighttime photograph of Beth Short's bisected corpse taken with a flash could only have been taken by the person or persons who placed her there. Who knows what evidence could be in the files? And sadly, who knows what may have been deliberately removed or was lost? Only current investigators assigned to the case know if this important piece of evidence still is in the file, or if it was lost. And so I leave it up to you to come to your own conclusions. The LAPD showed that corruption was commonplace in the years before and after Beth Short's murder. The only question is why they would have covered up her murder. Brenda Allen and Black Widow forced before her, knew far more about prostitution clients than Beth would have known. Even if a prostitution ring had tried to recruit Beth, her refusal to work for them shouldn't have put her life at risk. Allegations that Beth was murdered due to prostitution or abortion rings come from myths. Beth was not pregnant, and she was not a prostitute. Anything she might have heard or witnessed would not have put her in any jeopardy greater than Forrest or Alan had been in. For all the secrets they knew, they only did time for their crimes and were then free to go about their lives. A lot of people knew more about abortion rings, prostitution rings, and organized crime than Beth Short did and walked away. If Beth Short was murdered for something she knew or witnessed, it must have been greater than what the famous madams knew. And it must have been something that caused the murderer to fly into a rage. The brutal beating and cutting was then followed by a calm, deliberate surgical procedure. Remember that Dr. Newbar called the bisection a fine piece of surgery, and Detective Harry Hansen's testimony before the 1949 grand jury. I have a little pet theory of my own. I think that a medical man committed the murder, a very fine surgeon. I base that conclusion on the way the body was bisected. It is unusual in this sense, that the point at which the body was bisected is, according to eminent medical men, the easiest spot in the spinal column to sever. He hit it exactly. I've seen many horrible mutilation cases, many of them, and if any of you ladies and gentlemen had ever seen a case like that, and would see the pictures of this Elizabeth Short case, you could detect the difference immediately. Coming up next week we will look at the remainder of the suspect list and focus on little-known suspects. The week after we will look at the last of the popular suspects, Walter Bailey. And then the final wrap-up episode of the Black Dahlia Investigation.